Hey, we're here today with Dave Personier. We're going to brew a batch. What kind of beer are we going to brew today? Today we're going to make Indian Pale Ale. Ooh, sounds good. And this will be the first running, first time I've ever used a new hop called Zythos. They're supposedly only going to make it this year. It's a cross of five different hops. Part of one of the crosses is um, Amarillo. Amarillo is very, very popular with all the brew pubs because it's really, really pungent. But it's so popular that it's hard to get. So they did this cross to feed the supply. So that was the last edition of hops and the last 10 minute edition. Everything else was pretty standard. Cascade, first wort hopping, and then some Northern Brewer for bittering. All right. And yeah, you saw the recipe, you'll see the recipe. All in all, can't wait to taste it. All right, well, let's get to it. This keg I actually bought legitimately on the internet. It's always a good source of yeah. hardware. Sebco, that's where I think uh, one of our members has their whole system. If this was a turkey fryer they advertised Father's Day one year. It's a European one. Okay. So it's 50 liter. And then I put the side glass on it. Came with the welded. Uh, coupling on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll just put 10 gallons in for a 10 gallon batch. You uh, piece this uh, stand together with. Uh... Yeah, yeah. A famous home brewer named Marty Nature, uh, part of his other career, was a metal fabricator. Uh, for a place that would make the one outside fire escape or or internally you know, metal obviously mm -hmm. so I gave him my dimensions he cut them all at his shop Chris Rip found me this grating and then I took a turkey fryer thing a conduit hanger attached the turkey fryer to it so it's working great ever since All homemade and very, very inexpensive. <laughs> so this is just basic uh, angle iron mm -hmm. that's been cut with a pro cutter. But I did all this drilling. Others would weld now, but I didn't have a weld, or I didn't bother a welder. So I put a drop or two of oil on it and drill, drill, drill. I only went through one drill bit. There's a million holes in this thing. <laughs> and it's completely square. So it's 100% level, 100% plumb. I actually had to put a little tiny wood wedge under my mash tun uh -huh. to keep it totally level because the dry floor slopes a little. I'm filling now, but I used to fill the night before and let the chlorine gas escape overnight. Chicago water is pretty heavily chlorinated. And then when, uh, in a re recent trip to Goose Island a year or two ago, they said all you got to do is bring water up to 160 and the chlorine's gone. So if this water goes to 175, we got our 10 gallons, slightly higher. The chlorine's also very volatile. It only has to sit up for an hour or so and it pretty much escapes. Isn't there, uh, other than just the chlorine gas that they were using, there's some other uh, chlorine chemical? Chloramide is the chloramide, other. Chloramide, yeah. And uh, I don't believe Chicago uses that yet. That is tougher to get out. Mm -hmm. So some free boil to let that precipitate out with a tablet of gypsum. But I don't bother yet, and I don't think Claude Chicago uses it. Okay, so last night I thought I could either take two dry ale packs. I'm using SO5 for this batch, which is the Chico yeast, California yeast. And uh, I collect extra runnings at the end of my sessions, and I throw them in the freezer un unboiled. And then I thought, you know what, why not save a pack of yeast? I was working in the basement anyway. I got a free starter material. I fired up a starter and said, I'll just use one pack. So this will be enough for my full 10 gallon batch. Mm -hmm. All right, so last night I had my scale out. I've already put it away, but measured out my grain. 
a friend in the club's son was learning metal fabrication in high school. He made me this dandy hopper to go on top of my grain oh, that's mill. That's nice. And uh, it holds roughly 20 pounds of grain. So my normal batches are usually between 18 and 20. This one's going to be 23 pounds. So did it a couple of shifts, but that holds 20 pounds. Yeah, I guess it would. Yeah. It looks pretty big. You notice the drill is all hooked up. I'm done drill, uh, done grinding, and I left it all together. But there's the final product. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's a pretty full bucket. It's 23 pounds. There's I can show you the recipe book in a little bit, but there's uh, 20 pounds of regular pale malt. A pound of carapils, a pound of aromatic, and a pound of 60 Lobobon crystal for a regular old IPA. Shooting for an initial gravity of between 1.06 and 1.065. What's the point of the screen here? Ah, it just came with it. It's made in USA, as you see. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. No lead in here. <laughs> I'll just take it apart now that I'm done. It takes about, oh, it's five, six minutes to grind up 20 pounds. Some guys in our club have made electric, or put electric motors and mounted these mills on plywood or whatever. And don't have to stand with the drill, but they flip a switch. Mm -hmm. I don't know, for five minutes, do I really need to go through all that trouble? So, that's my method. Well, with that large hopper. Right. Have to feed it, you're yeah. good to go. You'll notice I'm old school, I'm pen and paper. This is my recipe book. There's about a hundred recipes. I generally keep a recipe for every session. Notes, you name it. This is something that came from the club way back in the Stone Age. It was one of our premiums, 1997 Boss Premium. Had a lot of interesting info before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I still have it in here. But it's all outdated now. But anyway, these are all about oh, over 100 batches. And uh, you can see the recipe is starting to be written down. Uh, the one thing I didn't write in here yet, and I still have to do that I didn't do last night, I've got my water measured out. I had to add some gypsum because this is an ale. A lot of times people try to burtonize the water. And uh, I have been doing that lately myself. Oh, sometimes I'll make an ale just with regular Chicago water with no treatment added, but gypsum accentuates the bitterness and hops. So uh, I've found that my ale sometimes are kind of lame in bitterness, so I'm trying to tinker some more. Even and with an IPA, you certainly want a little bit of flavor in this one. Right, and uh, I generally do a lot of lagers, so I. Uh, if I don't say so myself, I think I'm a little better at lagers than ales. <laughs> so here's our, I'm going to do one teaspoon per pot of strike water here. I've measured out yes, with the well. 23 pounds of grain. Okay. And uh, with 23 pounds of grain, I figure 1.1 quarts per pound for strike water. Or, yeah, quarts per pound. So I put in 23 and a half, roughly, quarts of strike water. So that's just over six gallons each pot. That's got three, this has got three plus one or so. <clears throat> so we got it's time to fire up. Start our brew session. Gas on. Three stooges. How large of a batch are we doing today? Pardon? How large of a batch? Ten gallons. Ten gallons. Yep. Ten gallons will bring this fermenter. Well, we'll finish off at about twelve. It'll bring this fermenter about into there, and I'll dump that whole yeast starter in when it's ready. For Chicago water, it's it's uh, you get your statistics on it all over the place, but. You can get some pretty good readings out of some of the pump stations they have. For Tinley Park, the water comes out of Alsip, I believe. I had statistics, or received statistics in the past. I kept them, but they don't change a lot over time, so mine are older. 
it generally speaking it, re it mimics Munich water so to adjust for an ale I add gypsum but for a regular Oktoberfest or a Maybach or a Doppelbach I leave it alone for a Bohemian Pilsner I'll cut it with distilled water uh, my mash tun I'll fill with five gallons of distilled water with the grain and then my sparge water I'll add is gallon distilled in there with the Chicago water. So at 170, I figure about a 16 degree temperature drop from the grain when it's added to the hot water. And, and that's grain sitting in a cool basement at 65 degrees or so. The funny part is, or the interesting part for me was, I brewed two weeks ago at Brickstone and uh, they used my recipe and it was exactly the same for them. They'd, they'd uh, pipe water in while the grain was dropping out of a hopper, the grain dropped into the mash tun wet from the hot water coming in. They heated the water 16 degrees above the temperature of the grain sitting in their hopper. And depending on the time of year, whether it was summer and the brew room was hotter, they'd adjust a little bit. But it's just amazing, this exact same temperature drop. Customized mash tun, sparge arm built into it. It's uh, not put together yet from my last clean out. But it's very simple. I did. I know a way back one when I bought this screen, I noticed it kind of flattens out with the weight of the grain. So of course every home brewer they, they tinker, cut some pieces of copper piping, put some copper wire through and hold it from collapsing. There's my customization. Mm -hmm. I think I still have some stuck grain in there that I never cleaned out. So probably doesn't matter, but we got time to be picky. Then, here. Looks like that's the Zymaco. That's what we want to push sponsor products. Zymaco converted keg stuff. Compression fitting, or not compression fitting, just a weldless fitting. And then I always leave the valves open when they dry. It's always helpful to remember to close them back when you're brewing. Because <laughs> the water pours on the floor when you add it. Well, I've never done that. <laughs> right. Fire up the uh, sparge water. Sparge water is 50 degrees and you put it in the night, the morning of. The reason I didn't fill it last night because it was probably 30 degrees when I got out here. That's, it's 10 degrees outside. My garage sometimes gets close to freezing. Um, so I figure why bother eating it an extra 20 degrees from sitting over the night before. We'll just let that run while the mash mashes. Hopefully I'll time it just right. So that's 170 while I'm when the mash is done mashing. Our brewing assistant here. Right. Look at the brewing assistant. She's good for cleanup. Any spilled grain goes right in her mouth. I'll help you. <laughs> The uh, infusion water for when we approach mash out. In fact, uh, I've noticed from experience now that to get to 212 or full boiling takes a long time. So on a kitchen stove, I'm trying to remember to start eating this earlier and earlier so that when it's done mashing, I can actually use it at, it's at boiling temperature. So we'll see uh, how much capacity I have in my igloo cooler here to be able to do a mash out that infusion water that you saw earlier in the two pots that was three gallons and there's six gallons of water going in for mash plus the 23 pounds of grain it'll probably bring me up near the eight gallon mark so I'll probably only be able to get two gallons of the three in there to try and get to my mash out temperatures which would be perfect on an ideal condition 168 but I probably won't hit that but one of the things I just learned at brewing at the Brickstone, they never even go to mash out. They sit at 150. We were doing a 148 mash for an Oktoberfest. Stayed at 148. He researched his mash for a half hour to get the grain bed set. And he sparged with the grain at 148 and sparged with 170 degree water. Never even bothered raising his mash up. Hmm. So he gets 93% efficiency. So I can't really argue with his methods. So, uh... I'll still try to get up. Well, mash out mainly is designed to stop the enzymatic activity. Yes. Um, Although, uh, there's a friend in the club who 
is convinced that if you have a nice hot mash at the 168-ish mark, your sugars flow easier so you get them all out. And he does get towards 90% himself in a homebrew setup. Uh, I don't get that high efficiency, but I do try to reheat my runnings as I'm recirculating, so I'll take a pot full, and we'll probably film that later, but when I start to set the grain bed, I'll take a pot full out and put it back on the burner and heat it back up to 170 before I reintroduce it back to the cooler. So uh, you'll notice the first runnings are only at about 150. Over at 74 degrees, and every once in a while you gotta check these thermometers. This is a nice one, I don't know, I got it years and years ago. But uh, there's a calibration screw at the back. Basically, it just turns the face of it. But I got a—I just use a cheapy alcohol thermometer, which is very accurate. We found uh, from a boss meeting. There's a scientist in our group, and uh, he brought his lab equipment to check the, uh, temperatures or check thermometers to see how accurate they were. Turned out the cheapy alcohol ones were some of the most accurate thermometers, and I calibrated it to that. I haven't done the whole freeze boil cycle just because I'm too lazy. But if it's close to my alcohol thermometer, which seems to be good, I'm good. But I got the lid on here. I'm going to try to release some chlorine. Ah, the lovely swimming pool smell. Boiling swimming pool. Yes. It's almost gone. Though. It's getting more faint. It'll be gone by the time you use it. But I'll leave this off for 20 minutes or so. Shooting for 170. We are at 165-ish, getting close. Yeah, 170. Probably just once approaching 171. Higher up the better. Lower down the spray is too wide, it winds on your shoes. tips from an old home brewer. Four more degrees here and we'll bring this upstairs and add the grain. We'll bring this upstairs, add our grain. Because it's a good thing it seals well. Yes. Okay. Alright, come up to my uh, what do you call it? false bottom. It's plastic as you saw earlier. Uh -huh. It has a tendency to float up when the hot water's in there. So I leave this heavy duty mesh pedal on there to keep it down for the first five, eight pounds of grain. I just pour it right all on in. Just dump it right on top. Don't worry about balling in or balling nope. up on you? Not really. Never had a problem with it because one of the mash paddle is really heavy duty. So you'll see. It stirs it up pretty well. Now you'll notice we're getting pretty high up. But I'll let that start to settle in. False bottom down, and I just kind of slowly stir it in. It's all dropping into the water as I, as I do this. But if you notice, this is a pretty big paddle, it'll wax through a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll be, what's the temp? Did I hit it just right? I'm looking for 154. Some people mash ales at 156. Be a little higher gravity on this beer, so I kind of want real good, good conversion and real good uh, utilization of the yeast. So I'm going just a little cooler. What's that acronym? Malt. More alcohol, lower temperature. Ah, very good, very good. Never is that one. Way to go, Mr. Phil, man. It's a little bit of ball here. It'll dissolve. Now we'll stir. Yeah. Here comes the brew.
brewer's assistant wants to check to see what's the temperature. What do you think, I don't know. What's the temp, huh? <laughs> Put those dog hairs in the mash and brew the beer. <laughs> Alright, we are at 153 and climbing. I try to stir a little with the thermometer as well. See if I get a full accurate reading. What temp did we want there, uh, cameraman? Uh, I honestly have to say I forgot. What you oh, said. go back to the video. 154 is what we were shooting for. Guess what it is on this thermometer, Mister. Well, let's cameraman. see. Uh, oh, there's a lot of foam there. We'll see if we can get you reading for the camera. What do you think? One fifty-four. Yes. <laughs> All right. Spot on. All right. We'll put the lid on. Notice our level. So we're at nine gallons. I'm only gonna be able to get one gallon of mash out water in there. So I'm, I'm boiling three and I'm not even gonna bother with the other pot full. So we'll use that in a second. It's always better to have more than, than not enough. Yep. Cover it up, keep the heat in, and we mash. 104 degrees. Just let it keep going. I go for 175, thinking that as it goes through the tubing, it hits the grain bed, it drops five degrees. I'm starting with between 170 and 168. I never really measured it, but a friend of mine said he had a longer piping system. He thought he lost like 10 degrees and he'd heat his spark water at 180. I'm thinking I got such a short run and it drops into an insulated cooler lid. I'm guessing a five degree drop. So you want to spark at 168 to 170, nothing too hot. You don't want too much tannins being pulled out of your grain husks as you spark. So that's the theory. So, we're going to put together the fermenter, which isn't too tough to do. I'll be working with star sand. Generally, star sand is pretty easy. It's not too hard on the hands, but I've been using it so much lately, I kind of dry out the hands, so I'm going to just use the gloves. Star sand is wonderful because it's rinse free. This is the fresh stuff I just made Thursday night, and this is old stuff. So I was going to clean the thing out first with the old stuff and throw it down the drain because I'm about done with it. And uh, from there, we use the good stuff and let it sit there all the and I'll empty it back in the bucket and use it later. And for the tubing and such, we'll see all that comes out. It's a nice part to start staying. Just take a wet glove, get everything sanitized. This is the nut that sits on the bottom. Right here. This is uh, basically will then give you your connection to your ball valve. And you know, you're not working under pressure. So hand tight is generally good enough. I do take a wrench just to hit it a little bit. But you don't want to go crazy either because these are nice uh, old ring fittings that could eventually strip over time. So I'll just give it a quick tighten. Here. Here I go. So much one of these fermenters cost? This is back in the day when I got it, which is not too many years ago, four years ago. I bought the extra extension legs because it only goes to here. It's basically for a countertop or something or a floor. But with this, the extension legs, you can dump right out into a bucket for yeast, and you can also take your racking arm and empty right into a corny keg. So. I paid extra for that. I paid extra for the good ball valves. It's cost about nine hundred dollars. Mm. So not cheap. What I'll do also is I'll take a bucket of container of star sand and start dumping all my ball valves in here and get them soaking. Gotta wash your ball valves. Gotta wash your ball valves. <laughs> but you need the ball valve on to keep it from running down the hole there, so. We're doing all this while the mash is just sitting in the cooler and converting starch to sugar. So uh, we, we have some downtime. There's really no downtime in brewing. You always try to think of what you can do next. And uh, Some people, I see Goose Island and other brewers, they leave these clamps sitting in their sanitizer all the time. 
it really never touches the beer, but it never hurts for precaution. You can position this thing anywhere you want, but it's not going to run into anything. You notice the ball belt handles free to go. So that goes in there, close it. And what you can do is seal it up completely, just like the pros. You've got a cap for it. The ball belt's got star sand in, but I'm not going to cap it just yet because I'm going to run star sand through it as we sanitize. The racking arm is kind of clever. Again, no pressure fitting. Just this is the uh, outside of it. This is the uh, racking arm. I just wet the opening where it's going to fit in it so you get star sand on it with my gloves. This goes on the inside. This comes through. Again, this will all get filled with star sand also. This thing is hand tightened most of the time. Sometimes take a wrench just to hit it one more time, but you don't want to get too tight with this because the clever part is when you attach your ball valve, which I can show you in a minute, you connect this back up with your gasket. Same process, just in miniature. This is a half inch fitting. One of the little tips that Mr. John Blickman says in his instructions when you buy this thing is when you're filling up a keg, if you'll notice the handle on the ball valve is the same angle as the racking arm. So as you're filling up your keg, I still have to tighten it because it's kind of loose yet, but you'll fill up your keg like that and you'll notice it'll start sucking air. Well then you turn it down into the last of the beer and drain, drain the last bit out. Isn't that clever? Mm -hmm. That's good this is the old is it's very foamy but we've got a couple hours yet before we actually fill it got several hours put that way this is old starts and I don't really care if it does the sanitizing or not but I'm just getting rid of it I'll just uh, start the process here run some through my ball valves cracking arm there like you saw Start running up the walls. But we'll hit it again. Just I had extra laying around, that's all. I'm just this is overkill. <clears throat> Can never be too sanitary. Exactly. Eventually I'll put this in the bucket. This is the lid to it. It cranks down with a big wide band clamp to keep it airtight. But this is the beauty of the system too. This is a got a little bit of a lip there. Take this off and this is what makes contact and you drop that right in your star stand, pop it back on, and it should be good. Makes a nice seal. But I'll just empty this and run it down the drain. Oh man, it's been 20 minutes, 25 minutes of mashing. We'll stir it just to keep the enzymes moving through. I don't know if it's even necessary. When I had, went to the brew pub that I brewed at, their mash sat still for the whole, whole half hour that they mashed and then they researched for a half hour. So they did have fluid moving through, <clears throat> but I'm sure a stir up here and there doesn't hurt and it gives you something to do. It's like you're actually being effective in your mash. Not that it really matters, we'll see. But I would think it would case, help. I don't yeah. think it would help to break up like Yeah, if you got scar, bigger scar chunks thing, of it? grain too, you may have a slight dough ball in there and then you can see there's some maybe small chunks here. When I push against the wall you can see things break down a little bit, but it's already changing consistency just from the 
half hour we've had it in there, you can see the clarity in some of the liquid is coming true, coming through. We'll see if I'm still at 154. If I've dropped a degree, it doesn't really matter. Okay, we are at still climbing 150, still going up. One fifty-two. Yeah, about one fifty-two. Stop two degrees. Start adding heat. How's that temp? We are at one fifty-four, and we still got. 40 minutes of mashing, so I'm going to slow this down. But we're in good shape. A lot of times I have to wait for this thing to finish. But we're going to put together our last level with a three-tiered gravity fed system. Camp Chef Hooker. Do you have a gas grill? I do, and that's the tanks are in here empty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Customized nameless half barrel. Refract down to take a pre oil reading. Tubing for our mesh kettle. And we're all set. All right, for first board hopping in this beer, we're going to use Cascade Whole Leaf. And I'm going to do two ounces. i break it up. Okay. So our scale sits at two and a half now. I want to go to four and a half. That's almost a full ounce right there already. These are packed in big time. Not like the homegrown you're going to see later. Oh, over here. Yeah. Oops. That's the one. They gotta go in the beard. Okay, need another third of an ounce. That'll do it. That big old clump. That's about right. You prefer uh, leaf over pellet? Uh, whatever's cheapest. That little screen you saw on the bottom of my boil kettle. It's a decent filter for pellet. Uh, if I get a thick, thick brew with a lot of hops like a rusting beer, it's clogged so it won't run. This is going to be an interesting beer because I'm using a brand new hop called Zyphos. That'll be the, the flavor of the knockoff. Mm -hmm. First word hop is also part of your flavor. <laughs> Worst part. My full mash time. Gotta go up in the air. And you get your weight lifting in. Yep. We're going outside with yeah, it? Outside, you can get the garage door for me. That'd be wonderful. Oop. Thank you. Around the door. Exactly. Whoa! That's the 
as heavy as it gets. Nine gallons filled with grain. Oh. All right. Now, there we go. I can feel my back twinging a little. Let's see, sleeps all right. But there's still got to be a way. As you can see, I'm not the youngest guy in the world anymore. Got to be a way I don't. I can brew without doing all that lifting. So my next project is gonna be put another grate or a burner here and go to a half barrel mash tun, leave it all in place. Mm -hmm. So I'll brew out here. And then eventually no more lifting because I'm getting to be an old man. All right, let's get our boiling water out here. It is a good hour for mashing. And we are at, oh nice, 178 on this. Perfect. Shut her off by the time we're ready to use it after we boil off. We'll be down well 175. Where I want it. Good timing, Rich. Good work. Well, that's your spars water. This is the out. Uh, mash out water, yeah. So we're probably only going to get about 158 in the mash ton, so we'll do some recirculating. It'll take some time. That's all you can do with the limitations of the cooler. That's another reason I want to go three tier with a half barrel mash done so I can throw fire under it or have the capacity to do a full mash out with a water addition. We're at 210. Close enough for science. Take this with you out there, my good cameraman, and the mash paddle. Must take a bucket with you. Door again. I got it this time. It's easy. About 100 pounds lighter. Yeah, you need to consolidate your uh, brewing area. I do, don't I? But I'm not alone on this. Alright, here we go. A little tier helps to have step ladders around the house. That's about as high as I want to get it. About as high as you can get it. Yeah, I got almost two gallons in there. We'll stir that in and take a temperature reading for grids. You got the thermometer or is it? I'll get it in a second. I'll stir this in good. Gotta be gentle when it's this high. Yeah, just like I thought, about 159, 160. Not bad though. 156 is where, no, I'm sorry, 158 is where, which enzyme is it rich? The beta amylase or alpha amylase? It kills off the higher one. The, uh, uh, alpha amylase. Alpha amylase, there we go. So I'm at 159. So we've killed off both enzymes, the beta amylase and the alpha amylase. Just barely. So, again, now I just realized that pro breweries don't even do this. So, it's not that critical. So what I'm going to do from here is start more All right. So I took the first gallon and a half-ish or gallon or so out of the mash tun. And I'm going to reheat it before I add it back in. Because the temps are dropped pretty fast when they come out of that tubing. And I want to try and get higher up and uh, get it towards 168-ish, 163, somewhere in that range. So that the theory is that we'll get more sugars out of the grain the hotter it is without pulling tannins out of the husks, which would be get up, if you approach towards 170 or above. So that's that's the goal, the game plan. Uh, so this will go pretty quick on the propane burn. And if I go slightly above 170 on this, it's just all mash anyway, so it really doesn't matter. I'll add it back into the cooler stuff in the, in the mash tun or the cooler. It's probably 180 or so. What I could do is heat this to boiling, stir it back in, just like I did the boiling water. And then we could get our temps up real quick. Yeah, we're at 180. But going to boiling would take a lot of time. We'll just add this back in. Shut her off. Sorry, it's 
a little dark here for the reach, but I have to make do. Unless you get an electrician to give me some more lights in my garage. One good sign, Rich, as you may well know, is if it flows like this, you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. No stuck mash. That's a pain in the buttocks. Scoop it all out, reset it if you can. Comes out pretty quick, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's already fairly clear, isn't it? Sure. Happens after a gallon, you're set to go. I've been pleased with this mash time, in terms of after all my tinkering, it's performed well. Sets the grain back quickly. And I've only had one or two stuck bars, and partly it's my fault because if I use a lot of wheat or rye, it turns into gum in there. And I didn't use rice hulls. I learned your lesson. Yeah, I've, uh, I've learned rice hulls are very handy, especially in a lot of. A lot of funky brews. Mm -hmm. Adjuncts. I made a whip. Yep, that's it's required. Exactly. 50% wheat, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just asking for a gummy mess. Alright, so we'll fire this up as so this line drains. So you'd run it dry, huh? The line? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise it drips all over the Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see you close the valve. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, running it dry would be about 12 gallons. <laughs> no, be about six. Let's see. This fire going in. Whoops, and uh, the other valve. Well, we got a propane that quick, huh? Perfect. We'll let that reheat. Drink coffee. Almost ready to light up a cigar. So you're gonna do that how many times? I'll probably do this four times. That would be the equivalent of draining eight gallons out, roughly. And that almost redo the whole grain bed. Hello, Wilma. Do you want to be on the video, Wilma? The home brewer's wife. She slams the door. And she closes the door on us. We are at 158 already. So. And the more you do this, you'll notice that the initial reading and first fills the kettle will be closer and closer to 165. You're out here in your optimal temperature. So this is number two dump. Yep. Let me do this two more times, I guess. Let's get us the meeting. Oh, one of the little tidbits. You'll see banter on the internet about hot side aeration. What is that? Splashing of your wort on the hot edge of it or the hot side or hot part of the process. All the reading I've done on it over the years, it's all bunk. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Major breweries, hot side aerators, splash their wort in some parts of their process. You just saw me splash some. It's all bunk. Oh, this isn't wort yet anyway. This is just extract, so. Yeah, but it's that's the theory in the uh, whole process, you know, handling the extract or the. And when you boil it at this point anyway, you're going to be boiling off boiling that off oxygen that. you put exactly. in. Exactly. So, another reason: keep it simple. Don't worry about this, that, and that. As Charlie Papazian says, relax. Don't worry. Have a home brew, or brew a home brew. So final uh, recirc? Final recirc. We're still at a really high level, so we're just above 10 gallons in the cooler. And then we'll to the rest. Hot. And get some more kettle under there.
as we sat here doing the research, the temp fell on this few degrees. So it's you don't need the spark water immediately on draining the mash tun slightly because it was at the very top anyway. So we're not doing the rinse yet with sparge water until we get a lower level. Uh, one of the keys too is once you get to where you're just rinsing the grain, you don't want to go too fast. Uh, I barely open this, and because this is going through three eighths tubing, it doesn't. You can't go fast. You could go half inch. A friend of mine did. It went way too fast. And got only about 60% efficiency. Wondered what happened. Well, it expires too fast and left some of the sugars behind. But it should take, even at major brew houses, it should take a good 45 minutes, almost an hour, to sparge and get the proper amount of sugars out. The quarter inch? So, yeah, it's down now where I can get the sparge germ underneath. It's, we've already drained probably a gallon out. I've already turned it slower. So I can try to keep the two at equal speeds. I turn this right over and start the sparge. And our temps here are 174. I just need one more degree and I'll shut the fire off again. But if you can see, the spire jar is whizzing right along, just like it's designed. Isn't that cool? Neat. So a gizmo. But I customized it. It came with a tripod system that's set over it. And I just drilled a hole into the lid. And you can see the uh, up feed to the water. Keeps the heat in, I thought. And that's what brewing is all about. Tinkering until you think you're doing it right. And while the film is running, let's do our first wart hop addition. Hard to see with all the steam coming out, but there's my hop filter thing. Thinking of gizmo, it's called a hop stopper. Shameless promotion, but it's not the greatest. But I'm doing first wart hopping. If those of you who don't know, first wart hopping is your first wart, obviously, but it's not, your wart isn't boiling. So the hops that land in there are releasing their oils under cooler conditions. The theory is it locks in flavor and not bittering. So what you do in your recipes that you see out there, if you see a 20 minute hop addition, you replace that with first wart hopping. And the theory is that the flavor locks in longer, lasts longer on your hop flavor in your beer. So I try to do it with India Pale Ales, with the Bohemian Pilsner, and perhaps whatever Pale Ale you got. But like a lager, you only do one boil addition, so it's not necessary. But I think it tends to lock in flavor a lot longer. It smells good too. Mm -hmm. So the sparging process takes approximately what, one cigar? One cigar, full length. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, this is the beauty of the gravity system. You uh, have, don't have to handle sparse water, so what you do is you just handle your cigar. Mm -hmm. And that adds a certain smokiness to the, uh, to the final product. And if you'll notice here too, the, the runoff now is crystal clear already. Yep. Hold your fingers behind that uh, tubing so you can see it. Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Already the color has changed too. Mm -hmm. It's gotten lighter. This is working quite well. My levels are pretty steady. Oh, here you go. They're slowly getting wet in there, but I may have to stir those in with a paddle soon. All right, so we're uh, in for a good 40 minutes. Huh? Have we? Get the timer in there? No. Okay. Just guessing. Just about approaching 10 gallons. Yep. Sparks got a little slow there. Now it's catching up, I think. Yep. Shut this off. Now. So, just about collected everything you need here. Yeah, just about. I'm going to go a little higher yet because uh, the conical uses up a little more wart than the uh, than uh, carboys because you'll hit the valve to pull the yeast out and you'll get quite a bit of volume. Mm -hmm. You'll get a half gallon out or close to it. So I go a little higher. It's got cascade hops. That's what I like. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so I had the lid on, saved heat, and we have approached a boil here. Don't even need the flashlight now because it's way up to the top. We'll let it boil uh, 75 minutes. So in 15 minutes, I'll add the boil of hops, the 60 minute edition. But we'll let this start to roll real good so these things go in. And then uh, start to cook it. As soon as the boil rolls, I'll leave the lid off. Why do we do that, Dave Boss? Because we are releasing DMS. We don't want to keep dimethyl sulfide in the beer. DMS is just yucky in beer. It's like sweet corn. Don't want that. And I used to boil like this, but I'd get DMS in my beers. Hmm, why is that? Because I didn't let it release. And then a uh, tidbit I learned from the pros. You see the boil kettles come up to a stack like that. You think all the steam comes back in, but they've got a rim that catches that steam and runs it off because that's full of DMS. Learn something every day. Looks like we got a boil happening here. You don't want to boil over, so I might want some fire to turn it down for the start here. So it starts to roll. It was sunny every day. Just for the first 10 days, 11 minutes. I've had plenty of boil overs, as every home brewer does. I've never had one. Never had a boil over? Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. You got a home brewer unless you had a boil over. So what do we got here? We have homegrown northern brewer. And this is for bittering, so it's a 60 minute edition. And we are at 11.50, 10.50. So we'll be uh, shutting off the fire at 11.50. So we're on, and we've got a refractometer. These adjust for temperature. And it's always a smart idea to take a reading of your pre-boil or your pre-finished gravity, see how close you are. Just run that over, all it takes is a drop. And it measures in bricks, which is like degrees Plato. And right now we're at 13 bricks. And the rough guesstimate to, towards specific gravity is times 4. So 13 times 4 is like 1052 already, 1.052. Wow. So we'll probably go up to another 6 or 8 points during the boil, maybe even 10. So I'll shoot for 1.060 to 1.066, somewhere in that range. So we're, we're getting close. We'll be fine. One ounce. 10 minutes, one ounce to knock off. Get there? Yep. Not much, huh? Now we're going to do it next time. I have pulse measure. Yeah, that's one ounce. All right, we're ready. One for 10 minutes, one for knockoff. Okay, so it's the bag of the hops. Just opened it brand new. So false. We're going to add a clarifying agent. This is called World Flock, and uh, it's kind of a blend of Irish moss and something else. I don't know what, but you can add this from 30 minutes on to the end of the boil, but preferably 15 minutes before the end of the boil. Early is not a problem either. I'm doing it now so I can. There's the little tablets floating, but they'll dissolve. Um, and then we're going to start getting ready to put the chiller in, even though it's half hour away yet. We'll lose our boil when we do that. So This is my homemade posing because this is back in the day when I chilled in the basement with extract. I'd use this and this hose. This would connect to my laundry tub. <clears throat> now it's going to connect to the outside spigot or the laundry tub again from this level because it's freaking cold outside. It's 10 degrees. One little uh, tidbit. Try not to let the hose touch the side of your boil kettle because the hose melts. <laughs> Watch out for some blasting steam from water left in the line. Okay, the trick to this is to get it all submerged. Doesn't help to have all this foam. But I usually let this sit in here for a good 10 minutes to get everything sanitized. Keys to be able to wrap it. 
round so you can keep the kinks out. Let me take a drink of that. Take a sip this of came from the conference of AHA when it was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It was a cool glass, but we have one ounce of Xythos, as we've seen earlier in the video. Add that for 10 minutes for flavor. Ah, wonderful smell. Here's one thing I do to sanitize the ball valve while it's still boiling. I'll just run an ounce or two through, and right before I hook up my tubing, I'll hit that with star sand. Oil kills everything, right? Yep, in about 10 seconds. So, I'm gonna go down and get the tube. Well, actually, we'll shut this off, hook up our hose, and start the cooling process. We can kill the fire. Our propane lasted, yay! <laughs> Resanitize this. That will be our circulating implement. <clears throat> RV hose. Gotta have food, food safe, right, Ryan? Yep. Right, Rich? Yep. Hi, right, George. Yeah. <laughs> so then what I also do is a little tip for anybody is use the last or the first runnings of the super hot water to clean anything I got. Just using the taps, like for example, this mesh tub. Fill it up with hot water. Dump it out later. But we'll start to it. Oh my God, those hops. These are the knockoff hops. Knockoff. Why do we say knockoff, Rich? Because we just killed the fire. Those will be total flavor hops. Nothing but aroma and yeah, just aroma and some flavor when you drink the beer. Mm -hmm. That addition will wear off over time the more you have your beer sitting. On water. Coming out, yeah. Yeah, I it's slow. I noticed slower is a little better. The faster you're going, running the water through too fast, I don't get a chance to cool all the way through the coils. Yeah, it's more more efficient here, Cub. And you can see how fast, how much heat it extracts, and it gets steam immediately. And that was exactly. that was cold water going in initially. Oh yeah. So what I do is, my more chillers in there as you can see, and then I'll try to get it in the middle of the pot and then I'll stir this inside the wort chiller to move the wort around, the coils, speed up the chilling process. I'm using a half inch coil inside there, so by the time it gets all through, it does the job. It just takes about 20 minutes. First 10 drops it really quickly. The next 10 is the slower. And this time of year, that water is so darn cold, it's going to yes. go quickly. The beauty of winter brewing is your tap water is super cold. So we'll let that run. That's all for now. I'm going to get the tubing out of the bucket. Yep. That's the grab. For the end, here we go. Start pulling it out of here. Star Sand does its magic. I'm going to cover that for now. But I don't Get quite ready for that. More of a drain as we sit there too. But now we'll hook this up to the oil kettle and run it through the wall of my basement here to meet the garage. And we'll get plenty of sight and action because we got an eight foot drop. So keep it sanitized through and through. Rinse free sanitizer is the key. Get this other end on two. Now you can just let it drop on the floor and you don't worry. Oh. Rubber 
bands aren't made like they used to be. That's why they call it homebrewing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one will go to the garage. I'll just feed this through into the garage. I've got a piece of PVC here as the guide for you video folk. Feed that through, and then we'll pick it up in the garage. So there's our tubing we just fed up from the basement. I'll spray star sand this. Sanitation, even though I've run boiling water through it. Can't be too sanitary at this point. Also, the start stands a little slippery, so it helps get the tubing on. And there we have that. And we'll stir a little to chill it faster. Turn this off and on, speed it up. It's already starting to cool down to the point where you can touch the side of the kettle. Yeah. Up at the top. Don't go to the bottom. Don't go to the bottom where the fire was. <laughs> but uh, let's see. How long have we been chilling? 10 minutes. If that. 11 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're already sleeping. Warm your hands up on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. We left the bottom dump down open. <laughs> After all that. Actually, so what I did was I just ran the star sand out of the line first. There you go. <laughs> it was planned. <laughs> Notice the spill on the floor as we dumped fresh, clean wort onto the floor. <laughs> Oops, the valve's open. That's a glass oh, of beer heading right down the drain. <laughs> yes, there's always an accident or two. It wouldn't be... And I looked at this valve. Uh-huh, that was cool. But I didn't look at the bottom one, because it was still draining <laughs> star sand. Oops. We'll just see what kind of volume we get. This is crazy. One glass is a cost. Crazy uh, wort transportation system here. <laughs> exactly. All gravity. No, this is good flow. Uh-huh. That's the color. What do you think the SRM is? About six or eight on that? Uh, probably closer to six, yeah. yeah. Now it's starting to slow down already, so we are getting hot chunkage clogging. And this could be a real pain in the butt. This has happened before. Mm -hmm. In fact, I see chunks coming through. Not good. So, uh, after another little minor mishap of a stuck runoff on the, on the, on the work, we're going to carry five gallons down, busted my back. As it carried down, I'm going to have to manually ladle out the ladle last five gallons. Mm -hmm. We have sufficiently soaked everything in star sand that's going to touch the beer. And we're going to ladle out the rest of the beer by hand because our tubing clogged. And it's the screen at the bottom of the kettle that is probably the culprit. Most, almost definitely the culprit. So we have an open fermenter there. Not the prettiest thing, but the Brits have open fermenters without a problem. So, once again, do not worry, relax, have a homebrew, as we just did. <laughs> and we will start to ladle. Start nice. This is gonna take a little time. I was gonna say, it's gonna take a while. Get a bigger pan. Look at how clear that is after it's settled. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yep. Yeah, I aerate the heck out of it, that's for sure. Did the stray hop leaf here and there, but that's the purpose of the strainer. I got to change the battery. The delicate operation there is dumping it all over the thing. Yeah. All right. We have been just shy of 15 Plato. We're probably around 1060. So when I pulled this off, I had star sand and I swabbed it, 
to make sure that the ring or the uh, lip of this jug is sanitized. I've just swirled it like crazy. I'm just using the whole thing. It's at full croiz, perfect timing. I'm just going to pour it right in. And we have a yeast starter. Because it's at full croiz, we may have fermentation within the hour. So that's the cool part. I got a little bit of a specially home rigged oxygen thing. Okay, so here it is, right? It's an air stone. Hooks up to a little welder's kit. But when I used this way back in the beginning, it tends to float up because it's not heavy enough. So see the little wire there? That's customization, homebrew style. I use that wire and grip it around a racking cane. And then put the racking cane in the star sand as well. So that I can get it down further into the fermenter and swirl it. Nice customization, huh? The nice part about star sand too is the contact time is almost Im immediate for sanitation. So let that sit for a sec. And these are sold at every homebrew shop. Just a typical on off ball dozel by your oxygen at Menards. You're good to go. Attach a special customization tool, which is speaker wire that I put under a flame when I first did it. Clean it all up with any insulation or something. You can see when your accidents flow flowing because you'll push the star set back out of the tubing and you can foam on. There you go. No more star set in your tubing. Drop it in. Start there. You can tell when it's on. So it starts to foam up. There it is. I just kind of count to 30. Suspension. It's Although getting, we have a ton already. It's getting the full Yep. We have a ton already by the process of draining the cup. That's true. And that should do it. We'll get the lid sanitized. Air locked on it. Now blue is done. So a few complications. Complications make it real. You can't have every brew batch go perfectly smooth. Thus, you're in home brewing ingenuity. So there you can feel this, it's got a little ridge to it. That's the set. It goes down against the fermenter. Goes all the way around. Just came out of the star sand. That's it. And in the past I've done a swab of this, but it wouldn't hurt to do it again. Sanitize it. Could even pop this off. So you never know how active the yeast will be. If the yeast comes through, you want to make sure everything in contact has been sanitized. Everything's been swabbed. Or I'll lid on. I'll show you the nice cool clamping system for the lid. This is the little pressure connector. It goes in here. What's our temp there, Rich? We never looked. Let's show. Where are we? Oh, 73. And it felt cool. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So we're actually too warm. It's like it. That surprises me, doesn't it? Here's our brain clamp. It just snaps in. Start the clamping. It takes forever. You power drill for this. Okay, the last thing is the cork. It came with the fermenter. A little bonus. Of 
torque, insert, insert airlock. Do we have activity? Let's see. Good morning. Positive pressure. 